John chapter 3 and verse 30. I invite you to open your Bible and stand with me, please. We're going to move back to verse 22. What a great passage of Scripture to begin our new year. Uh, Hopefully next Sunday we'll begin a series of three or four messages. And... uh, But today the Lord has led this on my heart, and I pray that it will speak to me and every one of us in our church and those who may be listening. The Bible says in verse 22, After these things Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them, and he baptized. I tell you what, let's just stop right there. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, that... You're alive and well. Thank you that you're in charge, and I pray, dear God, for our country. I pray, Lord, that this will be a wonderful spiritual year for the kingdom of God. I pray, dear God, your will will be done in everybody's life. I pray that we will be available, will always be available to tell the good news of Jesus Christ. I pray you'll bless those in our congregation that are not here the ones that are sick. I pray, God, for total healing. And uh, we just thank you, Lord, for another day. A brand new year, you have let us come together and worship you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, look in your Bibles down to verse 30. He, talking about Jesus, must increase, but I must decrease. Seven simple words, seven simple, really hard words to pray, if you think about it. This morning, when I say the word down, what is it that comes through your mind at this point? Could it be down and out? Maybe downcast, down under, downhearted, or maybe even a downer. When you use that word down, many, many times it means something that is negative. Whenever you run from God as a Christian, whenever you get away from God, whenever you get out of fellowship from God, you never move forward. Have you noticed that? You never begin to go up in your spiritual life. You always go down when you run away from God. The word up sounds real good. Up and coming. The upper class. People ask me all the time. I, people just like to say this. What's up? And I always tell them heaven. Some people look at me funny and some people know what I'm talking about. Worldly speaking this morning, we associate the word up with increase in status and increase in power. Employees promise to take you up the ladder, not down. And that is really the mindset of the society in which we live. Now, if I mention to you the word Ted Beamer, Ted Beamer, do you know who I'm talking about? He was the individual man who led in the attack of the terrorist who hijacked United Flight 93. As you will remember with me, he said those two words, let's roll. Back in 1992, Todd made a list of the values that he wanted to be in his life. And his major goal, and I love this, he wanted to fly below the radar screen. By that he meant he wanted to be inconspicuous. Did I say that right? And to maintain a low profile. As I'm reading here in John chapter 3, I believe this is what John the Baptist was feeling in his heart and in his mind. Listen to what Jesus said about the man called John the Baptist. Verily I say to you, among them that are born of women, there is not risen a greater, a greater than John the Baptist. That's in Matthew chapter 11. And what a compliment by the Lord Jesus Christ to John the Baptist. When questioned whether or not he might be Jesus, this is what he said. 
I am not even worthy to untie his shoes. The religious leaders came to him and said, Who are you? Now, he did not say, I'm the founder of the Jordan River Baptist Movement. He didn't say that. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This morning, there are four points to the message as we look at this wonderful text. And the first point is simply the introduction. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus had been talking to the man Nicodemus. Then the scene moves to the Judean countryside. Look with me at verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and was and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Aenon near Salem, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had yet not been thrown into prison. Now the Bible says the disciples of Christ were baptizing. It also says the disciples of John the Baptist were baptizing. Now I want you to remember at this time in the ministry of Jesus, the popularity, even though he did not want it, the popularity of Jesus Christ was rising and rising because there were all kinds of people that were being healed. Friend, if somebody comes along and they begin to heal a lot of people, you're going to want to see them and be where they am. And because of that, many people followed him and the crowds grew bigger and bigger. Both groups were baptizing and John the Baptist was always and still preaching repentance. That is the word you don't hear a lot of today in this new year and old year that we've just come through. If you look in Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. In Matthew chapter 4, he said, G- he, Jesus came along and he said identically the same thing. He said, Repent, for the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. The Bible tells us that John was wearing clothes made from camel's hair, and he had a leathern girdle about his loins. In other words, he had a belt on, and he ate locust and wild honey. So he already looked weird, and he was eating some weird food. Now, secondly, I want you to notice with me that a situation arises. Look at verses 25 and 26. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that means teacher, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, all are coming to him. Wow. Now the dispute here can be defined as a discussion. It can also be translated as a controversy. And what they were really doing is they were arguing. Have you ever had a discussion with someone else? I know that husbands and wives have many discussions with one another. There was a Christian couple and they got into a big argument and the man said, Well, what we need to do about it is that we need to pray right now. And she said, okay, I will begin. She said, Lord, he's wrong. Amen. (laughs) Right here in the scripture, they were having a discussion. Jesus nor John were involved in the discussion until one of John's disciples came to him. Now, I want you to notice with me here. This is very strange. How they refer to Jesus in verse 26. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. I mean, in one translation it says, that man. It also says, the one you testified about. John, you have helped this man right here out. Now, everybody is not coming to us. Everybody is going to his meetings. Now, please listen. This right here is the fleshly response 
most of us have to that particular kind of situation. We want people to succeed, don't we? But we do not want them to succeed more than us. Hey, I'm glad you got a promotion, but I'm glad my promotion is a lot more than yours is, and that's the way we function sometimes. John's disciples, they got very defensive. They got jealous and they got critical. And the human trait of jealousy and resentment is common in the lives of today's believers. Now, Hickory with Church, please listen. We are all called into the ministry for the kingdom of God. The reason we're here today is to worship Jesus, not to see how many accolades we can get. But listen, we are not to be competitive with one another. Do you know why? Because you and I are on the very same team. Does that make sense? If Fayette Baptist or Somerville Baptist or Warren Community or any church in this county gets people coming down the aisle every week and they're saved by the grace of God and they're growing, you know what I say, hallelujah. We are not to be jealous about someone else. Now thirdly, I want you to see John the Baptist, his response. I can almost see the look on the face of John's disciples as they were waiting to see how John was going to respond. They were sure that John would rebuke this Jew. But Scripture says John did not react that way. Listen to it. He says, I am not the Messiah, but I came to pave the way. I mean, what a privilege to come and pave the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. Also, he said, nothing is given unless given by heaven. Now, when he talks about, he talks about a wedding, and he begins to talk about how all the focus is on the groom and not the bride. Look at verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. Now, in the first century weddings, all attention was on the groom. In that culture, the best man or the friend of the groom had a whole lot of responsibility. In weddings today, the best man doesn't do a whole lot, does he? Could we have the ring, please? And they put the ring in the hand. In that culture, the, the best man made a lot of arrangements for the wedding. Very often, he would bring the bride to the groom and presented her much like a father does today of the bride does. He let out the activities until he presented the bride to the groom. And you know what he did at that point? At that point, he stepped back in the shadows, and all the attention went to that couple right there. The friend of the bridegroom rejoices with the groom. He rejoices. Do you know why? Because his mission is complete. John is saying, fellas, you know what? I'm going to answer it this way. I'm very excited. I'm so glad that God's plan is happening, and He allowed me to be part of that little bitty plan. John understood he was part of God's plan, but that Jesus was God's plan. Look at verse 29. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is complete. Friend, his joy is complete. And what an amazing statement. How strong words those were. Great joy, complete joy. You know, the bridegroom is getting all the attention. The cameras are flashing in his direction. 
The voice of the bridegroom has replaced the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And just in a few days, months, Herod is going to silence John the Baptist's voice once and for all. Now, why mention the bridegroom's voice? Only because his voice means that he is here. And the friend is glad that he's here. Another voice is being heard. I mean, it is a greater voice. It is a stronger voice. John had preached repentance of sin and forgiveness of sin, but he could not be the Savior and did not want to be the Savior. He could not save anyone, but Jesus could. And now I want to give you the greatest statement of all. That's the fourth point. Look at verse 30. One of my favorite verses. He must increase, but I must decrease. This right here, y'all, is one of the greatest statements, I believe, in human history. John the Baptist, he is not backing down or backing off because he does not want to confront the issue. The man we're talking about, John the Baptist, is a man full of courage and backbone. Do you remember when the Pharisees and Sadducees came to him? He looked at them in the eyes and head and he said, You vipers! That's pretty strong, y'all. You snakes! Who warned you to flee from wrath to come? You need to repent. He confronted King Herod, and you talking about courage, about his ungodly relationship with his brother's wife. Wow! Now, that didn't go over too well, did it? It ultimately cost him his life. See, I believe that John the Baptist is embracing the will of God for his life. I wonder today, are you embracing the will of God for your life? Does everybody in the church house know today that God has a plan for you? He has a plan for your your mate if you're married, for your children, your grandchildren. God has a plan for everyone And we need to get in the will of God that we might be spiritually what is called a success. Not physically, but spiritually. Notice the word must in that verse. The word must here means necessary. It is necessary for each one of us to become a nobody in order for God to use us For his kingdom. See it is God's plan. That you become nothing. So he can shine through your life. In this world. I mean you know what the Bible says. In the the sermon on the mount. He wants you to be the light of the world. He wants you to be the salt. When you walk into a room. My friend it ought to get a little bit brighter. Where your friends are. Where you go to the grocery store. And friend, you know what salt does? One of the things that it does, it irritates. You know what happens when you put salt into a wound? Salt will. It, we are to be light and we are to be salt. For that to happen, we must humble ourselves before God. Why? Listen, why are so many Christians living a life today defeated? Now think about that. Why are so many Christians today living a life of even misery and also sin? I want to tell you why. Because individuals will not put God first. It does not matter how many times we say in our life, Jesus is first. Friend, He must be first in our lives. Especially in the days in which we're living right now. See, humility puts God first. Why is it so hard for us to set aside ourself? I mean, my agenda, hey, my will, my desire, my interests, my fleshly cravings. Are you with me? It could be this morning that we, we are, because we are afraid of losing the life we have planned for ourselves. And you know, to me, that's funny. And every time you tell God your plans, I know that God is laughing about what you're telling Him. 
If he's got a plan for your life and my life, just like he had a plan for John the Baptist, we must be humble and we must get in the will of God. <clears throat> okay, for Christ to become more and you and I to become less, I have four or five quick things I want to tell you right here. Number one is we must understand who Christ is. If you look in the Bible, the Lord Jesus has many names, but I want to mention one of those right now. It is the name Lord. In the New Testament, the word Lord is used 3,325 times. And here's how the dictionary defines the word Lord. A person who has authority, control, and power over others. And I like the word master. See, if you allow Jesus to become Lord, you are allowing Him this morning to be greater. How do I do that, preacher? Listen, all you have to do is say, Lord, I want to die to myself, and I want to be at your will. I want to be obedient to you, and Lord, on this day, blot me out and be the Lord, the boss of my life in every decision. Friend, when, when Jesus is Lord of your life, and you go to buy a brand new car or a brand new house, you talk to the Lord about it first. And for goodness sake, if you ever get married, you better be talking to the Lord about who you are to be with the rest of your life. He's Lord. Thirdly, we need to love as He loved. Let me ask you this question. Is your love this morning evidence that you are allowing Christ to become greater and you become less. I want to tell you an illustration of my life. Now, I'm a very good driver. I was going down the highway and the speed limit was 55. I pulled out behind somebody that was 35 going. They weren't 35. They were going 35. Listen, my actions and my thoughts immediately did not reveal I was becoming less. I did not love that driver very much, especially because I was in a hurry. But when the driver turned on their blinker, I want you to know that I rejoiced. <laughs> now, I want to know, are you like me? I believe sometimes, listen, you better not, well... If you need patience and you pray for it, you better get ready. Because it's coming. I mean, it's coming when you least expect it. So you better be ready and remember that you prayed for it. In Ephesians chapter 5, I want to read this to you. If I can get over there. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. And walk in love, there's that word, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Wow! Be imitators of God, dear children. I mean, we come in here and we sing our songs, don't we? And we do all that we do on Sunday. And we go out of here and sometimes we act just like the devil, don't we? Be imitators of God. Now, fourthly, we need to become a student of the Word. Mm. If you want Jesus to increase and you decrease, Colossians 3.16 says, Let the Word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And then I love 1 Peter chapter 1. The grace withers, the grass withers, the flower falls, but the Word of God, the Word of the Lord stands forever. Let me ask you something. Are you a student of the Bible? Well, preacher, I read my Bible every once in a while. Let the doctor come in and tell you you've got cancer, my friend. You'll get in the Word real quick. Won't you? If you're not a student of the Word, I want to know why you're not. What is keeping you from being one. And then there's number five and last. In order this morning for God, for Christ to become greater and you become less, we need to live a life of prayer. 
You know what Jesus did? He taught the disciples to pray. How often did Jesus pray? My friend, he prayed regular. He prayed all the time, I believe. And he even died praying. He prayed, not my will, but yours be done. Matthew 10 just jumps off the page at me at this point. It says, whoever loves mother or father more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. You know what Jesus demands as we're going in to this brand new year? That we love him more than anyone. Well, preacher, you mean more than my wife? Sure. Have we not learned yet that if we love Christ more, we'll love our wife more? And put her in the place that God wants her to be and vice versa? That we follow Him, that we trust Him with all of our heart, that we be fulfilled and satisfied in Him. And that we obey Him more than anybody else. You know what? Less and less of me and more and more and more of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm fixing to close, and I want to ask you something. Will you as a person, I'm not talking to the person next to you, will you as a person say this this morning? Jesus, no matter what, must increase, and I must decrease. Will you in your heart pray that prayer? And will you mean it with all of your heart? Friend, I've always wondered what would happen in a church. doesn't matter how big or small it is. What would happen in a church if the membership would say this verse and mean it with all their heart? You wouldn't have to talk about revival anymore, would you? Because revival would come. You wouldn't have to talk about people walking the aisle a lot because people would be walking the aisle because we would be decreasing and Jesus would be increasing in our life so we're in the year 2022 what will you do with Jesus that is called Christ remember this time last year we came the first Sunday of 21 We've come another year very quickly, y'all. You can't redo anything you did in 2021. But you can make a new commitment this morning. And we're going to have an invitation in just a moment. Some of you need to come and just grab me by the hand. And just say, I want Jesus to increase. And me decrease. And then go back to your seat. Some of you need to come as a family. Some need to come to the altar and just pray and pray as long as you want to pray. And then God's speaking to some people to come and join our church, which we always love. But God also is speaking this morning by the Holy Spirit for you to come be saved if you've never been saved. Why don't we talk about that so much? Because, friend, that's why we're here. For a person to come and give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist said, you got to repent. That's a change of mind, change of heart about your sin. And by faith, that means to believe that Jesus died on the cross, that He was buried and He rose again. And if you really believe that this morning, you can be born again right here, right now. So what decision does God want you to make? I've already made mine. And I hope you'll make yours. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the invitation we're about to have. We thank you for the precious Word of God. And I pray that your sweet spirit has already moved in the hearts of many people. And we will make our decision on this first Sunday of this new year for you. And we will live it every day of this year. 
Help us, Lord, to do away with ourself. Help us to make you Lord of our life. And Father, I pray you'll save the lost. And it's all in Jesus' name. Amen.